Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. Each episode, I speak with industry experts from the attractions world. These chats are fun, informative, and hopefully always interesting. In today's episode, I speak with James Rodliffe, Operations Manager at Stonehenge, part of English Heritage. We discuss the challenges and positives to come from a change in audience this year, from international to domestic, and how Stonehenge will maintain a blend of physical and virtual events for the future. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe on all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. Right, James, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. I'm super excited to have you on. I feel like I feel like we've spoken a lot on social media, but we've never properly had a chat. So this is going to be fun. I'm really excited. Thanks for inviting me on. You know, I'm I'm a big fan. So, you know, I, I've made it. I've made it on to skip the queue. This is amazing. <laughs> I love this. This is, like, <laughs> this is like the highlight of my day that people are excited about coming on it. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Well, as you know, if you are a big fan, we always start with our icebreaker questions. So let's get going. I would like to know what is the greatest either TV show or TV or film from your childhood? Uh, Oh, lots of uh, lots of options. I'm going to have to go to Goonies straight up the Goonies it just ticks every box um it's amazing and for me you know I I was really interested in the the cut the history and the and the the maps and that you know I'm, I'm a nerd um but then finding this treasure I was also really worried that the treasure got destroyed at the end you know <laughs> I'm the same when I watch Indiana Jones you know I love Indiana Jones but at the same time I'm panicking when they're destroying the temples or or this precious uh, history or archaeology is being lost but yeah no, the Goonies is is just fantastic Great, great choice. I am like, I'm a child of the 80s and those films are like comfort to me. Whenever I'm a bit, whenever I'm a bit under weather, under the weather, or like and you have a little duvet day, it's always an 80s film that goes on. Something that you've watched like a billion times that's yeah. just really comforting. And that is definitely one for me. Next question. Would you rather give up social media or eat the same dinner for the rest of your life? Oh. That is mean. I, lo- I love social media. I, I, you know, I, I, a lot of my friends live all around the world and it's, it's part of the way, we, you know, you, you, how we all work nowadays and, and stay in touch with each other. Um, but I love my food. I don't know if you can tell from my physique. I love my food. I, I just, I couldn't, I could not eat the same. And there are some things I could eat a lot, but I couldn't, I couldn't eat the same meal over and over again. I would, I would ditch the social media and probably be a healthy person probably <laughs> for it so, in the long run. But yes, I would have to go for that. What's your favorite meal? If you had to eat the same meal every night, what would it be? Oh, that's that's so hard. Maybe a, a glorious green Thai curry, you know, would probably oh, yeah. be the absolute top for me. Um, but yeah, absolutely adore Thai food. When uh, we, I was lucky enough to go out there a few years ago and yeah, the place was amazing. The people were amazing, but the food, oh my God, the food. Yeah. Oh, lovely. That is a really good choice. It would get a bit boring if it was the same every day though, wouldn't it? You just mm-hmm. oh, repet- lose the magic. Okay. All right. I might have had a little bit of help with the next question. Uh oh. You'll probably know who when I ask you. What's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you at an airport? <laughs> oh no. Um yeah, I might know who'd be behind this one. So um, I, t- I, I always, <laughs> calamity <laughs> seems to follow me Kelly, around my life. And um, on one particular time, um, we, I was, so this was uh, the young Paul Griffiths, no doubt this helped you here. Mm. We were, uh, where are we going? We were coming back from Norway, I think. We, um, we got some funding uh, to, uh, to go out as we were putting together some, some work when we worked at the Mary Rose together. And we were flying up to Norway. And um, for some reason, um, when I went through the uh, scanny machine thingy that scans, they do the like the heat temperature in the metal detector. For some reason, can't tell you why, but my lower regions glowed a glorious, <laughs> glorious radiant orange. And I, they pulled me in to, to get like proper strip searched by these wow. big, big Norwegian chaps. Yeah, it was um, it was quite the experience. Yeah, and then and then after it was all done, and I put my clothes back on and I was walking away realized I'd left my iPad I had to go back and speak to them again and say I'm so sorry oh the horror <laughs> I know I think they thought I was coming back to get their number or something but, um <laughs> yeah that was that was yeah 
<laughs> wow, that is um, that's unexpected, isn't it? You don't, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're really not expecting that. To yeah, happen. thanks, thanks, Paul, for that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Paul. I'm so glad that I asked you. Oh, okay. Thank you for answering all those. What's your unpopular opinion? Oh, so this is this is going to lose me a lot of fans straight off the bat. I think people are going to turn mm. off Ooh. straight away. But um, I don't really like ABBA. Like, I really don't like ABBA. I know, I know, I know, I know, right. So everyone's got their, a, a band or an artist that they just, they just don't get on with, right? That it's kind of just, yeah. I, for me, it's ABBA. And this has landed me in all sorts of bother throughout my life. And another, you know, um, one time when we were out again in Scandinavia, in Sweden, and we took, um, we worked with the Vasa Museum in Stockholm, beautiful museum with a, with a ship, um, a little bit newer, but more intact than the Mayor Rose, absolutely gorgeous museum. And we were being, hosted out there um whilst we worked on, again on some projects and um we they they said uh, oh the, the abba museum's just opened down down the road we should take you and i had to explain that i didn't really like abba and honestly explain to swedish people you don't like abba honest ah oh, their faces their face so they just couldn't comprehend it like they just just could not understand it but um uh we went anyway i think there was must have been yes it was the trip where we took uh some of our volunteers from the mayor rose with us and we all went into the abba museum and it, you know, it was it, it's a fabulous museum they've done an amazing job but the subject matter was <laughs> i just i just really really don't like it um so that was that was interesting but fabulous fabulous attraction if you're ever in in stockholm you should go and see it whether you're an abba fan or not <laughs> i feel like you've just made yeah you're, you're trying to dig yourself out of a big hole there james <laughs> yeah. i would just like to state that out the the views of our guests do not reflect the the views of our <laughs> podcast <laughs> uh. tune in um <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I feel like we're going to get some tweets about that. <laughs> I'm going to get some hate mail about that. Maybe. Oh, <laughs> right. Let's get into having a chat about you and Stonehenge because this is exciting. So, but let's just, I just want to say that we are recording this. So it's, it's the 5th of March today, um, which is a day that parents all around the country will be rejoicing because it is the end of homeschooling. Hopefully for now, let's keep our fingers crossed. Um, but it is also, it's St. Pyrrhon's Day. It is St. Pyrrhon's Day, Day yeah. It's the National Day of Cornwall. And we just had a lovely yes. chat about this off air, but I think it's really, this is really special for you isn't it because this is where you're from absolutely yeah so I was born born and raised in Cornwall and um uh kind of strong Cornish identity kind of uh well everyone I think who was born and, and grows up there has the you know it's a very special place and it has a very much its own character and history and legends and stories and, and actually growing up there had a massive impact on me because I was you know very very touristy uh economic environment down there anyway so that was always a big part of of um of, of living down there but also surrounded by these you know amazing um uh, standing stones and ruins and hill forts and on windswept moors and there's just this kind of sense of magic and mystery down there um and you know these there's lots of these kind of special high days and holidays usually involving food a fair few drinks and um a bit of dancing and, and all sorts of good good times um but uh, yeah that had a really big impact on me i think growing up this is a huge sense of storytelling in cornwall as well you know so i my friends laugh at me because i don't seem to be able to answer a question in a short way there's always a story a <laughs> rambling story to my answers but um you know i think that's partly growing up in cornwall just the way we 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 explain things and weave things and you know I think that's had a really impact big impact on my later career as well yeah well this segues really nicely into you know what your background is and how you got to where you are now because you mentioned you know growing up in Cornwall you were really kind of part of that kind of tourist econ economy and and um you know experiences that were happening there is I guess is was that the start of it you always knew that you would kind of work within that industry or I think so I think there was I mean <sighs> there was it was just what I did at first my first jobs you know a few decades back now were working in busy pub kitchens or working in summer retail environments and that's what all of us all my friends did the same you know working uh, on, on the beaches in shops or, or whatever or you know I was working on a caravan park at one during one summer it's just what it's just what the the economy was um but alongside this like i said being surrounded by the kind of the history and the and the legends and the stories as well they kind of fueled a bit of a dual passion in me i suppose which was the you know facilitation of these stories and this history and the heritage to people to explain what these things are and what they mean and and so that yeah i think that did have a really big uh, really big impact on me but um yeah i mean cornwall is absolutely 
chocker with attractions lots of people go down there because the place is beautiful and they want to get a sense of the, the food the culture the history um, and lots and lots of different attractions have popped up as well to help them facilitate them and help them part with their cash as well some of these attractions amazing a couple slightly more questionable um but um <laughs> but all in their own ways amazing well worth a visit you're now at stonehenge but i know that you worked at the mary rose previously with paul who was who's very kind mm -hmm. to, to help me out with the with some of those questions but um and Paul has been a, a previous guest on the podcast as well. But I think that you started, was it banking that you actually started your career in? Yeah. It's so quite a big I, change. <laughs> it is a bit, yeah. So I, I studied archaeology, I decided to study archaeology through uh, through to postgraduate level. You know, I loved finding out more and more and more of these stories beneath our feet. And I just couldn't get enough of it. Um, graduated with my master's, you know, I worked actually as an archaeologist in the field um, for a while on a few different digs, um, as well as balancing various other jobs, you know, whatever, whatever came up. And um, then graduated my master's and you know kind of hoped to swan into a brilliant job in heritage or archaeology and obviously that's not necessarily the way the world works um but an amazing opportunity came up and I went to work for Lloyd's Bank uh which was right after the credit crunch and right coming up to the PPI scandal it was a it was quite the time to work for <laughs> banks and I got involved with um kind of customer complaint handling and um how how to tr how you should treat your customers and you know how to retain business and how to help put things right when things do go wrong and that was really really useful for me so having that kind of the history heritage side and then being thrown into quite a corporate environment but one that was was in a bit of a crisis really and, and having to find a way out of that was 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 actually really useful so I did that for a few years um uh, worked hard you know got all the experience I possibly could but I really you know my heart had to get back into heritage I knew I had to make the step back so started looking around and um and a job popped up down down in Portsmouth on the south coast at the Mary Rose where they were just getting ready to set up the new museum and it was to join the conservation team as as to help install the the objects so they were looking for people with experience you know who had handled objects and and could uh, work on projects so I, I applied. It was it was the pay cut. You know, it was it's, it was a short contract. It was a massive gamble. My dad was very unsure about it. Um, yeah, I was like, Dad, what do you I don't know. Um, but I decided to we decided to go for it. Moved down to uh, Portsmouth, and uh, yeah, the, the the project was amazing. I spent a year being able to um, you know help install this incredible collection you know there's 19,000 objects in the in the Mary Rose collection and the museum itself if anyone hasn't yet gone it must go it is absolutely phenomenal they've done such a good job there um you know 30 years in the planning it, it and it really shows it is it is beautiful so that was amazing then joined the operations team once the installation that had, had done uh, and um, worked in different roles, front house manager, um, visitor operations manager, and then I wor wor worked as part of the marketing team for a little while. I kind of did everything. Um, was there for seven years, which I think in your late 20s, early 30s is a long time to be anywhere. Yeah. And I, 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 yeah, so I started thinking, you know, I, I there are people that work to them, uh, do work in the Mary Rose for their entire career, and you can understand why it is a stunning project. But I knew it was um, probably getting time for me to to move on to a new challenge. And I did really want a challenge as well, something to really sink my teeth into. So I was kind of keeping an eye out. And this job popped up at uh, Stonehenge where they're looking for an operations manager. And, you know, you hear in my history there that just kind of ticked a lot of boxes for me um so again up sticks moved up to Salisbury and, and joined Stonehenge um June the 1st 2019 so straight into the summer straight into my first summer solstice uh solstice is also my birthday so that was Aww. a nice nice treat to have 10,000 people celebrating on my birthday <laughs> how wonderful um, they all just it, turned <laughs> up just for you I know it's <laughs> fabulous um but that was really lovely um and the first summer I mean it was a whirlwind like you know we we dealt with some really busy times at the Mary Rose but you know the Stone, Stonehenge and sites like that they're a different scale you know um, you're talking a um, huge amount the, 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 everything is just scaled up massively um, and the visitors uh, come from all around the world it, it's just the most incredible place um, but it was a, it was a steep learning curve but we had you know our busiest ever summer day during that first summer the winter was fabulous um, we had our busiest winter day as well that year and we were you know we're just starting to put in some quite ambitious plans around looking at you know the admissions process and kind of moving it from what it is which is a stunning product into making sure that it's a world-class visitor attraction as well 
And then, of course, COVID hit, didn't it? Gosh, <laughs> so, I mean, you had a really big start to your career yeah. there, didn't you? <laughs> straight yeah, in into a summer solstice in. and then, hey, smashed in the face with the pandemic. Absolutely. And I've spent now more time at Stonehenge under, under the kind of pandemic situation than I did beforehand, um, which is really strange. Um, so, yeah, I feel like a bit of a kind of wartime operations manager <laughs> in a way, you know, it's, but but it's, it's, it is fabulous. And it means that, you know, I've been able to be part of this quite dynamic time there which is which is really interesting in at the deep end with both feet absolutely couldn't couldn't have planned that more perfectly right (laughs) if you can get through last year you can get through anything James I hope so yeah (laughs) (laughs) so what what worked well last year for Stonehenge because a huge change you know not being I, I guess you were you were closed for a certain amount of time but then outdoor attractions were allowed to then start to reopen and stuff what what went well what didn't go well yeah, so I mean, it was, I mean, what a year it was, right? I mean, for, for everyone in the sector, it was it was incredibly tough. Um, what worked well, I mean, so we actually received some of the best feedback um, we have received in, in recent times during last year, which is, I think, outstanding. Mm-hmm. And that kind of came about because we, so we really took a, well, not a step back, we took a lot of steps back, back, steps back to look at the entire visitor journey. I know it's a cliche visitor journey, but really, really did kind of, think about every single touch point uh, with our visitors with our members with our supporters staff volunteers how that how we could make it work you know when if we when we were coming to reopen the site and not just our site but you know there's 100 well English Heritage looks under 400 sites you know 130 uh, uh, sites of staff Um, how are we going to reopen the portfolio and make it work and so we we, we looked at what people's expectations would be around COVID and, and what, what their priorities would be once we'd um, once we could reopen and what they would actually want to get from the site. So we took that, we took, like I said, every single step of the journey, every touch point, and we just worked our way through it. And everyone kind of, you know, honed in on this single mission to make this the best that it could be in the circumstances. And also to kind of mitigate against any times and if we did have to step back and say there's a bit of the experience there that you're not going to be able to access in Mm -hmm. the same way what could we do what could we do otherwise then and so that worked really really well and that went you know that process all the way through pre-booking booking admissions arrival the whole day and um and we looked at what we had you know we've got you said we're an outdoor attraction we've got outdoor space what did people want after being locked in for so long they wanted to get outdoors and <laughs> and spread out and and breathe and and a bit of normality so um we started looking at you know what could what could we do a bit different so let's tell people that, you know come and bring a picnic have a picnic in the monument field what a lovely thing to do and this you know stonehenge right there um you know come and walk the landscape instead of um because we have our shuttle buses now if people are in a bit more of a, a hurry or 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 they don't fancy the walk or whatever we have the buses and we we kept them going as well especially for those who who, who couldn't or didn't want to walk but um if you if you can walk walk you know and, and spread out enjoy yourselves and people came they spent the day um and they they really really had, had a great time and alongside that we would we had lots of projects working on how we could better engage with people at home uh different formats that we could use you know tying in with education platforms and all the other needs that people had as well um and and it worked it, and it really worked and and what was amazing is that all this planning all this kind of forethought um into the kind of operations people noticed and you look on TripAdvisor and people are noticing the operations and they're commenting on the offer and people don't normally do that you know <laughs> they, they've really thought about where to put the barriers and where to put, have people stand and this kind of you know people just don't normally say that so that was that was outstanding and it, and it really um it really felt good the other thing that worked really well you know was our staff they have just been outstanding absolutely outstanding and I just I just can't thank them enough you know all the way through this uh, process they've been um practical and intuitive and supportive and they've just wanted to make it work you know they love the place they really really love the place and you can see that in in how they approach everything and the feedback from visitors alongside the operational stuff has been about the staff you know I arrived I was warmly greeted I was made to feel safe and secure like they'd really thought about everything and and that that was really really magic as well another thing is our VIP experiences so we have um, stone circle experiences where we can host a smaller number of people outside of the normal opening times where you can actually go 
go inside up close to the stones. And normally this is often uh, quite heavily in demand from international audiences and, and larger tour companies, but we're able to offer this out to a domestic market. So you can't go on holiday. Why not come inside Stone Circle, mm-hmm. inside the you know Stonehenge Stone Circle? And that was amazing. And people were having like the feedback from that from from domestic audience was f- fantastic. Really, really impressive. Um, I also am a big fan of our hand sanitizer. I think it smells delightful. But, uh, <laughs> it smells a bit like tequila. And was it you or Carly? Oh, was, was it, is it is it you? Carly okay, loves right. tequila, but me, I can't even think about it. Carly would have a lovely old time, but um, <laughs> you'd have to bring your own. But um, no, slight <laughs> slight tequila whiff. But no, I, I, that that I think is 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 lovely as well. But no, the, the entire you know that coming together, we were just chuffed to bits to see in the face of all this adversity that actually we delivered something that we are really proud of yeah it's it's so interesting isn't it because this the more people that I speak to in the sector the more this comes through is that the things that were really important to to visitors that were coming is that they were welcomed it still felt like a really lovely warm experience for them regard you know aside from the fact that there were extra security processes in place and barriers and things it still felt like a great time for them to come um and it's the, it's the team that makes that. It's the front of house team. And it's the people that care about the, the place and care about the people's experience that make that happen. Did you find that, because you mentioned about people kind of like walking to the, to the stones and people kind of bringing picnics and things. Do you, did you find that people stayed longer and had a, a, a kind of a, an, a, like a longer experience there than they normally would? Is it, Definitely. So in yeah. a way, you know, less people actually better experience with the people that did come. Absolutely. And, and you know, we, uh, we, we encouraged it really because we, although we had our, we had our caps and we were trying to get that balance right of safety limits in terms of, because obviously we're a big, we have got space, but there are um, our facilities, you know, they are big, but they you know, still need to be very mindful in terms of the number of people, you know, coming through in, in, in the hour slot. So we were very, very cautious about that. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we encouraged it. Come bring, spend the day, bring a picnic, really have a wonderful day. And I think, you know, domestic audiences, if they're going out, you know, they, they're not necessarily doing like you do on holiday. You quite happily do two or three things in a day. Quick, go take your photos off. You go again. If you're going somewhere domestically and you're going to be parting with your hard earned cash, then you're going to spend, you want to spend, you know, you get the most out of it. So that was, that was fabulous. And, and, you know, actually some of the things we tweaked helped facilitate that so so we said the picnics in the monument field the landscape walks the um uh, we we couldn't hope we have these uh, our beautiful uh, replica neolithic houses on the site right which have been made by our volunteers absolutely gorgeous and they're basically experimental archaeology based on uh, houses that are excavated nearby on the landscape and they're, they're phenomenally interesting and some of them are um actually have all kind of neolithic replica artifacts in and the volunteer will sit in there and they can light a fire and you can come in and hear about it and it's just incredible couldn't do that in in covid so what we did we brought that outside into the middle of the village um and actually made it kind of more approachable and accessible in some ways and that was a huge success and people were sitting there and really engaging and so that really helped and actually some of these things that we put in we thought this is in some ways arguably better you know so I think there's some real lessons there for us to take away as well so that's interesting because this brings me to what this year looks like so obviously you've got you mentioned you you'd have quite a predominantly international audience and 2021 I mean let's face it we we have no idea when people are going to be kind of flying in from from anywhere so your audience goes back to a predominantly domestic what challenges does that throw up for you um do you carry on doing the things that you did last year or are there more things that you've got to adapt and change for this year? Uh, well, it's, it's, you know, it's undeniably going to be a massive challenge. Um, the, the last year has been a huge challenge for our sector. You know, us as a charity, we rely on ticket income as so many other organisations do and not having that international audience is undeniably going to have a, have a, a big impact on that. Um, we've had to delay things like our, some of our conservation projects and, and maintenance projects because we just don't have the ticket income coming in. And that, you know, will be a, a, a further symptom of um, not having necessarily, you know, as many any international uh, guests coming in um, and yeah with the majority of our visitors each year are um, are international so so what are we going to do about that so we we know that, that what works last year and we took a lot of lessons from that and I think we are you know we're well we 
well prepared to do a, a comparable, if not better, offer from the things that we learned last year for our domestic audiences, um, which is which is exciting. Um, we have got um, infrastructure on site that is dedicated to coach groups and international audiences that we're not that isn't going to be used by them. So how can we better use that to help you know spread people out and make it a more comfortable and better experience for them as well? Um, but you're right, you know, we have to think about car parks and and what happens if the car park starts to fill up because people aren't coming on yeah. coaches the changes in dwell time and what that will do the other parts of our offer our catering and retail is that as relevant what doing your you know looking after this big domestic audience as it was in this international one um but it does give us some some real positives as well you know we we've the staycation market should be strong um and in fact some of english heritage sites had uh, one of their best ever years last year because yeah. especially in the west you know people were looking looking around thinking okay we can't go to to, to magaluf we can't go you know we can't go to, to the jungles of Papua New Guinea we've got this amazing castle three miles away we've never been there and let's go and have a day there what a lovely thing and and you know they, they some of the some of our sites had an amazing year last year and I think they will again have a strong year as well but other sites will have more challenges you know what the ones that are more indoors will struggle um and you know those who rely heavily on, on international tourism like us will have uh, will have those well, those issues but you know it's going to push us to be more inventive and and uh, um, problem solving come up with uh, new ways on making sure that they offer really is good um and you know it's things like our special our stone circle experience tours things like that again i think we've got a great season with that lined up and, and a whole new audience to really speak to there as well it's it's amazing isn't it you're talking through about how s- there's so many things to think about when you're in an operational role like you mentioned about the car park in there you know if people aren't if, if lots of people aren't coming on one coach and then loads of people are coming in all individual cars and that changes that completely. This, it, it blows my mind to think about how you, how you even start to plan all of this out. You know, you, you mentioned the catering. So does your catering offer then have to change to if people are going to come for the day and they're going to stay for longer, is your catering offering hampers, you know, so they can have the picnic and then that shifts in that sense. Whereas if they're coming on a tour bus, that might have been, oh, are they just going to grab like a quick sandwich or a scone or something to eat while they're looking at stuff and then they're, and then they're off again. It's, there's so much to think yeah. about. Like, how do you even start to plan this? It's such an epic task. It is. And, you know, talking about catering, you know, are people coming for two meals, you know, now? And, you know, what, what does that look like? And, you know, thinking about thinking about all those different things. And, you know, you said retail products. Are they, are they going to be the right for, you know, for the different audiences? Yeah, I mean, luckily we've got just an, an amazing amazing team I've got some amazing amazing colleagues and and so we have we've been putting a lot of thought into this and you know finally we, we you know it's what a week it's been we got our dates last week which obviously kind of paves forward a bit of a, a roadmap for the for the coming weeks and months and and you know hoping to to uh to get open ASAP um, in a safe way but it also means that right now there are some deadlines so we need to we really need to get planning but also we you know we weren't we didn't necessarily know what we were opening into so um, when we do open uh, I won't be able to open our exhibition at first because indoors you know indoor um, interpretation spaces so that's going to be a challenge so how do we offset that and make sure that's as good as it can be Um, what is quite exciting is that you know it has actually fast forwarded some other measures so our um, new audio offer is going to be uh, ready for when we reopen which is brilliant um, we've been able to crack on our new cafe is going to be open you know for when we reopen so it's going to f- it's, it, there are lots of new and exciting things already in the bag which is really which is really good that's great as well because I guess that kind of engages with people that have already been before that live locally too so there's something new for them to come and see there's something new for them to experience which means you're kind of engaging with them and drawing them back so it's not just kind of a one-time visit I'm um, I want to ask about the venue and, and if if you need to adapt it in any way for different audiences, not just kind of international to domestic, but potentially less attentive audiences. So this was a question that Mark Ellis sent in um, from the National Memorial Arboretum. And he he's kind of asking around if your audience changes to to maybe kind of like Gen Z. I don't really like these acronyms. They drive me mad. But, you know, a younger generation that have maybe a slightly less, uh, they're slightly less attentive. Are there new things that you're thinking about that you're going to need to implement to, to engage with them? 
It's a very interesting question. And you know what's funny? You know, I'm thinking back, you know, 10 years or so, and the same question was, you know, replace Gen Z with the word millennial. And it was the same question then. And as a older millennial, um, <laughs> you know, I was there thinking, I love museums. I don't know why, why are they worried that I'm going to go. And, and I know lots of people like me that, that really like going to these places. Um, and and you're right, segmentation is is super useful and a super 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 unuseful at the same time you know so i think doing it by age groups is is a slightly dangerous route to go down because lots of different age groups um act in different ways you know i see on site we see people from you know one to 100 and some of them will be really attentive and interested and some won't be um and that doesn't necessarily depend on on the age group um i think you know perhaps looking looking at you know are they are these people experience seekers and what you know if that's what they want if they want to come and make memories then how do we best facilitate that Mm -hmm. and we have the um benefit of having we've got Stonehenge you know it's one of a kind it's very authentic it's very amazing and when you're there you know stood in that field looking at you cannot help be mesmerized and that is that is brilliant and you know no amount of AR VR you know crazy different ways of technologically um adding to that will take will will be able to match the magnificence of the actual you know monument itself that being said i think there are lots of different ways that we can tell stories and that we should be uh, we should always be pushing ourselves to you know just because we've done something a certain way for a long time doesn't mean we should keep doing it that way and i think we should always be keeping an eye on what whatever tools we can use in our arsenal to make to make that the best possible experience it can be for our guests um some of that i think is giving the space to people to explore it in their own way and not being overly prescriptive and this is the way you should experience it this is the only way to you know only way you'll get the story is by listening to this guide or standing at that point or following that exact route give people the space to do it now some people will want to be led you know they'll want to know oh, i'm scared of missing something if i don't know follow the exact route other people they want to just go and 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 do it in their own way and they might want to stand in the field and you know catch pokemon or something i don't know you know there are different different ways that people want to enjoy that environment um i think the other thing is talking about younger generations is certainly the the young generation now they are more into the outdoors and nature and fitness Absolutely. and health and well-being than certainly i was sat on the couch in the shell suit eating pork pies and cans of coke you know uh, as, as a young person these young people they're out they, they run for fun uh, this is something that i've discovered much later <laughs> but but you know they're they're you know they they different things are important to them so um again us uh we have a lot of outdoor space this is brilliant for us but i think other places should think about that what is important to these audiences not just not just kind of changing the offer to match them but looking at what you already have and, and matching that to the need and there are some stuff like you know talking about making memories you know we we are looking at where is there some cool places we can suggest that are the ultimate selfie spots you know yeah. you know there's you know silly things like the, the shot that everyone wants you know that 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 great bit that people want to share on on uh, social media with their friends so yeah so bits like that but that's great right so that engages with them in something that they they love to do but also it's beneficial for the for the you know experience you they share that content it's user generated content it gets shared across their social media channels it all helps to promote i can't i i am a big fan of museums introducing kind of instagrammable areas because i think it's just an incredible way to to be able to promote and engage with that different audience that's what they want to do you know they they, they want to capture that perfect moment as well um i want to talk about kind of virtual stuff as well. So I know that um, obviously summer, sol- summer solstice, you did some virtual elements around that last year. Yeah. What, what have you got kind of planned for this year? And, and so what, what events have you got planned that might be virtual? And what might always stay virtual or go back to physical? Is there, is there plans to kind of keep that, keep some of, some of those things hand in hand with the, the kind of real life experience? Yes, yeah, it's, um, it's a good point. And we, we've been dabbling with um 
sharing the soul how do we share the solstice with not just the people that can make it to site but how can we do that and, and like you said the solstice last year where we weren't able to sadly weren't able to host our managed open access to the stones we had an empty field which is a very unusual thing on a solstice like it's mm. probably been a very long time since that happened um but we were able then to share that experience um with the world and people from all around the world tuned in to see it a huge audience of people both the summer and the winter solstice and people found it you know really quite something and actually the winter one I was working in the evening so we still have a few people on site just checking you know sure everything's okay I worked the evening slot but not the morning um so I was I woke up but I woke up quite early at home thinking I hope everything's okay and I kind of tuned into the live stream and I was just actually just lying in bed watching the sunrise over the stones it was wow. so beautiful so lovely um and that has been a real success and they're definitely you know we'd love to do some more of that to share that for people that can't get here and especially this year even if domestic audiences might be able to travel um, international audiences might not and so you know we know it's a really important thing to people so more of that yes more of that absolutely and we've got our, our skyscape camera as well I don't know if you've seen that which is there's a camera up at the stones basically which whenever you want to any any time of day you can go onto the site and you can see what the sky is doing at Stonehenge and you can click on different filters so you can see where the, where the stars are moving where the sun's moving everything which is which is really lovely and that is you know that's here to stay that's really lovely um, we've got some new projects that are kind of launching this year which may well um uh, fuel future ventures as well but we've got um songs of england which is just coming out which is a english heritage wide uh, project um, working with amazing folk singers to um to, to bring kind of english folk songs to the to the sites uh, these amazing you know the amazing sites we have that tell england's history um which is just fabulous and that's really really lovely um, we do have other stuff in the, but I'm not allowed to talk about them, uh, in the <laughs> to come. So keep an eye on the website and our social media channels. But um, but there are other things that we've, we've blended, right? So when we talked earlier, Kelly, about um, not, if there's things on site that you are unable to experience firsthand, is there any other way of getting some of that experience? So we had our agile interpretation. I love this phrase, agile interpretation, which is kind of brainchild of some of our very, very brilliant um visitor experience and, and learning and um, interpretation uh, colleagues who um, you know start producing things okay so for us our houses I said you couldn't go inside the houses and have that experience UK the volunteers are outside and they're showing you things and engaging that way but how can you just close that gap between what we did have pre-COVID and what we've got now um, so we've got it's QR codes. It's just a, pretty much a simple post that says, want to see what it's like, scan this QR code. And then it pops up on your phone and you're in the house and you can see the fires going right. and you're inside, you know, just closing that gap. And that agile interpretation is quick. It's relatively cheap. It's, um, it's, and it just works, you know, and it doesn't have to be perfect. And I think there are lots of places that could could look at that you know and think oh it's such a shame we can't do this part of our experience what what can you do then to close yeah. that gap in and that blend of kind of digital and physical I think is going to be really important as we go forward yeah I love that I love the way that you've described it as a blend because I think that's exactly what it should be and it's exactly what people are expecting things to be now it's it's really weird like even even me that works in a kind of digital world it's never been my first, you know, I'll go and look at a website of, of a, as an attraction that I want to go and, and visit, but I wouldn't engage with the website as much because I knew that I was going to go to the physical place. Mm -hmm. But now I'll go to the website and I'll look at everything that I possibly can just to try and get that kind of sense of experience of what it's going to be like. And I can remember a month or so ago, um, you've got like a... Um, you can you can click on the stones and it tells you what each of the stones are called and, and where they came from and, and information about them and I spent a good hour kind of clicking through and looking at it and you could kind of change things around and it felt quite it you know it felt quite immersive it was quite a simple thing but it kind of gave me a sense of like oh yeah this I would I really need to be there now you know it sort of built that excitement and I think that's what's important about having these virtual experiences is it builds the excitement about going and actually that that kind of anticipation that's what you want in people you know you want them to be super excited when they come and I think that the only way to really do that is to continue doing these things that are you know digital that you can share with anyone and, and everyone around the world. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that, you know, we're talking earlier on about that, that kind of sense of welcome when you arrive, you know, you should be people should be excited about coming to our site still, even, even reopening into social distancing or opening into social distancing. Um, we are, you know, we still need to make sure that people are excited that these, these are um, magic days that, you know, we work in these environments where we're bringing people to have amazing experiences, and they should be, you know, should be excited to have those. So I guess there's, this question is probably it's something that you've probably done already because you were able to open last year to a certain extent. But what more do you, can you put in place so that your front of, of, of line staff feel really kind of safe and secure about what's happening? Because, you know, they're the first people that, that interact with the guests that are coming. So, you know, essentially they're kind of front line, they're, they're, they are, there's an element of risk there for them, right? How do you make them feel comfortable? And is there any more that you're going to have to think about this year, potentially with new kind of COVID strands? Yeah, it's 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 a great point. And yeah, this you said staff are that first point of contact. So if if staff do feel nervous, they do feel unsafe or they do feel worried, that's going to come across. So, you, you know, that's got to be top priority. And for us, that was always, always at the top of our priority list was making sure the staff are safe, that they feel safe and that they understand everything that's happening. So they aren't, you know, that they are an active um, part of the whole process. And that has been a, a thread that we've pulled all the way through. Um, so what we did, for example, when we uh, opened, you know, after the first lockdown, which has been opening and closed a few times now, <laughs> after the first lockdown, what we uh, what we did was we um, we had put all our plans into into place. You know, we had you know those who were not the few of us that weren't furloughed. We had you know spent a long long time coming up with these very clever plans that we thought. And um, then when, when we got all the team back as, about a week before we uh, opened up and. We talked them through it. You know, I led the team around socially distance, um, led the team around the site and said, this is what I'm planning or this is what we're planning. And these are the elements of the site we want to tweak. This is what we're thinking. You guys are the experts. You're on the ground. You deal with this every day. You tell me, what have I forgotten? What could we do better? And there's brilliant feedback. And they and they came and they shared and they were very, um, very happy to come up with solutions to other problems or just highlight things that, you know, I don't know what the solution is here, but this is something we're going to have to watch. And then what we did when we did get around, you know, we tweaked and we made things better for them, made them an active part of that process. When we did open then, the first thing, we, as soon as we closed on that first day, we all gathered around. Uh, socially distance and uh, said you know what 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 went really well today what worked what parts of these you know very clever plans that have taken us ages to draw up actually worked and what didn't work what could what could we do better you know what could we tweak and we did that every day for the first uh, week or so um and we tweaked and changed and they really felt part of that process they felt listened to um and they you know and they and they felt a lot better it doesn't take away all the nerves you know all of us working in a pandemic you know or just living through a pandemic it's exhausting and it's terrifying so you know you can't take away everything but what we, what we have done is work really, really hard to make sure it's the best absolute best it can be um and we, we've we're lucky we've got some amazing people that work for english heritage and i have to shout out to alex page who's our head of um safety who's just the man deserves a knighthood after this year <laughs> He has been an absolute uh, national treasure. Like, you know, we've had to interpret a lot very quickly um, and turn it into plans on the ground. And, and Alex and his team have just been phenomenal in, in supporting all the site staff in, in being able to make that happen and then being <laughs> infinitely calm and patient with us while we ask lots and lots of questions <laughs> as well. So so we've been lucky there. But, um, but you know, this everything from making sure that the staff rooms are safe so we you know we we, we had to um we weren't able to do in classroom learning so we had that resource so we took the classroom classroom is now a welfare room everyone spread out you know and 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 but the priority there was the staff need beyond above the education you know staff if we can't if the staff aren't safe aren't happy aren't um aren't okay then we can't open but it also throws up other challenges you know our face your face-to-face -face briefings that we would like to do a lot of and get that feedback the more you have the more you incrementally slowly creep up that risk factor what about all the lovely appreciations and the hand clapping and the huggings and the well done and leaving parties kelly we've had people that have you know retired during this year that have been at stonehenge for years and we'd normally you know party we'd you know at least gather around and and, and celebrate and share and and that not having that has been really tough 
tough. So, you know, there's some things you can offset. So our briefings, we move them onto the radios and, and you know, where, you know, where we can and try and get, again, that balance, that blend of the physical and the digital or, or other means. But, um, yeah, it, it has been difficult, but a lot of it is, is you know, a lot of communication in, in terms of explaining why we're doing stuff as we're doing it all the way through, you know, every week, you know, more in, internal information comes out explaining not just what's happening, but why it's happening. And if you need anything, if you need any support, you know, where to find it, if you have any questions, uh, where to where to uh, where to ask those as well. Um, and there's, you know, been a lot of other kind of because everyone in our sector has been in this same position, you know, so there's been a lot of good sector collaboration around this um i have to give uh rachel a shout out um rachel uh Mackay with the recovery room website being that she's been a good friend throughout this and she's produced a lot of resources if people um haven't found it yet go onto the recovery room because there's a lot of information about supporting front house teams there as well Rachel has been absolutely fabulous. And so Rachel was a, a previous guest on the podcast, actually. And what we'll do is we'll pop um, the link to her website in the show notes for this show as well, because it is something, you know, if you are planning your reopening um, processes now, the resource that is on that blog is is pretty phenomenal, isn't it? And I know she's been doing some consulting with other organisations as well. So, yeah, that's really lovely to see. And I think that's Again, that's a huge positive that's come out of this is, is that sector collaboration, but also how adaptable, you know, adaptable everybody's been, you know, the flexibility that people have had to have shown in the roles that they have um, and how quickly things have changed, you know, in, in terms of what you can and can't do, but also, you know, being given a week's notice that you can reopen again and how that impacts people. It's been phenomenal. And, uh, and what's been really lovely to hear is, is how you've engaged with your team and you've made them part of that process. You know, it hasn't been, we've made the decision and this is how we're doing things. It's how is this going to work? You know, this is what we think, but you, you know, like you said, you're the experts, help us. I guess that is part of your culture now already, but how do you, if, if it isn't, how do you embed that for the rest of the year and then, and, and for future, you know? Yeah, it's really important that I think we all, all of us make sure we don't lose some of this them some of the positive legacy of covid if it can phrase it yeah. like that <laughs> yeah. you know um some of the things that have changed maybe for the better ways of working that have uh, improved that we don't lose that when things start if they if if and when when they do start sliding back into normality of some description that we don't lose some of that really positive stuff you know that we make sure we do keep collaborating um, with our colleagues and use our teams who are the experts on the ground and how to look after guests and where pinch points are and what's the same question they get asked 732 times a week um, and and how we how we use that feedback and make things better um, and quickly, not just collate it and put it into a chart and then sometime in a year's time we might get around to it, but be agile and and like you said, um, get on with things and, and make it happen. So, you know, there are some things you're talking like zoom love it or hate it what a way it's transformed the way we work you know you can now gather all your experts together at short notice onto a zoom be sharing slides everyone's kind of tech savvy not that people necessarily want text you know they're comfortable and confident to be able to do it uh, and just make it happen and that's become part of the way we work now so that you know will speed things up and hopefully probably lower travel costs and have all sorts of positive environmental things as, as well um i do get a bit zoomed out sometimes i don't know about you but you know especially if you're using it for for professional and then for you know socializing as well it, it can get yeah can get a bit much but it, it's it's yeah it's hugely you know facilitated this um this quick acting these quick discussions you can go away do work come back discuss it and that flexibility has been really useful um that kind of you said about the creativity from the teams in solving these problems that's a positive thing that we need to keep moving and, and keep that discussion alive as we go forward um and the agility you know you said a week's notice well sometimes you know you think back you know we'd have Boris on the telly on a Sunday night with things that need to be action Monday morning yeah, and that crazy. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, absolutely crazy. And so we've, you know, all of our, you know, we 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 at Stonehenge, you know, Stonehenge being very outdoors and very open to everything, we have really good kind of 
cascades and, and emergency comms protocols anyway. Perhaps not everyone had that. And this has highlighted actually sometimes you do need that. Um, and, you know, make sure that you can be as agile and don't lose that again. Just don't get into don't get into a position where you think, oh, it's OK. It's not pandemic. So what, what could nothing worse could happen now, could it? Um, but there's some lessons I've taken away, you know, as, as, as well, Kelly, that, you know, around the planning elements for it, that, you know, even with our best business continuity plans, I don't think we included things as we didn't appreciate things such as the emotional impact of a pandemic right so we had great plans in how you know we had a plan for a pandemic we had one you know what would happen if we had well we'd keep going people fell off sick then the managers would come you know it's like picking up the rifles at the battle of stalingrad you know you someone else would pick up the mantle you keep charging forward but um and you you know make it the best it can be but actually what's the emotional impact there like how how do people feel about coming to work that wasn't in our uh, business continuity planning so you know things like that are, are important and things around contracts that you sign based on the assumption or presumption that you know you'll always have x many thousand visitors coming why would why could why would you close for six months or a year or whatever you know so thinking about supply chains and contracts and that flexibility as well i think is really important yeah absolutely it's just it's been utterly phenomenal hasn't it and i think you know what you were saying about that emotional aspect i don't think any of us realized quite how significant this would be on our own mental health you know I think that when when the pandemic started I can remember sitting back and thinking whoa okay so I need to work out okay so what projects have I got on that are that I think might not be happening now you know what have I got that was coming up next month that is now not going to happen um so how do I work out that what projects are what projects are still going to continue how did the team feel? How do I get them set up working from home? How does this all happen? And it was more the kind of the logistical operation side of, of the physical stuff that I thought about. And then you started to sit back and go, actually, people are really scared. And I'm a bit scared. I don't want to leave my house. I don't want to do these things. You know, all right, we weren't allowed to leave our house. But, you know, the emotional side was a secondary thought and a secondary response. And I guess that's something that I want to take forward and not be that I want to think about the, the emotional side before the kind of logistics next time I think that's yeah. really really important it's definitely still happening now you know we've still got I really sympathize with the people that you said you know we had leaving parties for people and then that you know we never got to hug them and we never got to say goodbye we've had team members leave and their last kind of thing that they do is click the zoom button to yeah. leave the meeting and it's, <laughs> it's like just not the same oh is it? <laughs> You know, that's, that's not how it's supposed to end no, so sad not. we are planning when when we can to have a gathering you know to, to everyone who's not had that benefit of a, a proper thank you and a send-off you know to to get everyone back together you know um which yeah. will be a it'll be a glorious sunny day you know it's going to be marvelous and i will have a cider or two. Oh, definitely and maybe a pasty maybe. As well. <laughs> <laughs> i i need to talk to you we're coming to the end of the podcast and i've got okay. i've got two more quick questions for you but i really yep. need to ask you about the fact that your face was you know superimposed onto the stones at some point last year tell, tell us about that it was yeah, yeah. an experience <laughs> it was an experience yes going back a couple of years it's not it's not the first time my face has been projected large onto something and and it happened at the mary rose because i <laughs> accidentally became the face of the advertising campaign for the reopening of the museum dressed as henry the eighth this time i wasn't dressed in tudor outfit and i didn't have to wear a cod piece so that was a relief <laughs> first of all um, can no, i just say though <laughs> i can remember seeing those posters on the tubes before I even knew you and said and then when I saw them on your Twitter I was like oh yeah these were everywhere <laughs> yeah that was that was a strange time um yeah this was much uh this was this was different like I said less less costume but um this was no it was really really touching actually um and it was um all about saying thank you to some of the people who had, who had managed to continue the amazing work of different charities supported by the Heritage Lottery Fund and that the the, the that actually people still playing the lottery is still having a massive effect because the support that they are giving to the lottery fund was able to keep these places going keep like our heritage sites like our amazing charities and like lots of cultural uh, institutions that were looking after people who you know were, were quite marginalized and and during the during the pandemic even more so it was lovely i was in mighty company um projected onto those stones and they'd never been dedicated like that before to to individuals and really i was kind of representing all, I 
all the good work that the team had done, you know, um, that everyone was doing on, on, on our side. And really, you know, I, I feel probably as a face of our operational teams around the whole country that are working to keep sites going, who, who have been turning up every day through the pandemic and still traveling and still working to look after our important places that needed looking after. So, but yeah, no, it was a, uh, I, unbelievable to to see it. it was really did bring a tear to the eye to see it it looked amazing it was yeah, yeah very special. incredible thing to be part of for last year yeah. really incredible one quick question and then mm-hmm. the final question so okay. um mark ellis wants to know have you visited the national memorial arboretum it's brilliant you know it's on my list it's on my my very long list that I've just grown throughout the um throughout the pandemic all these wonderful places I want to go to you don't want you to be scroll through places you're like oh, I must go there I must go there some of the list is long now so as soon as we're out of this I'm up there Mark I promise uh, Mark uh, it's on my list as well I pro- we'll, we'll be there maybe we'll do a group outing we'll, oh we could organize Lovely. a skip the queue oh. outing oh that'd be nice oh gosh you've just given me so many ideas for all right all right, Mark. Thank you for your questions. They've sparked good ideas today. Um, we're at the end of the podcast. We always ask our guests to recommend a book. So either a book that you just really love or a book that's kind of helped shape your career in some way. What have you got yeah. to share with us? So I've really had to think about this. So I don't do a lot of reading of technical um, books that I probably should do. Um, one of the few that I've read that really, you know, amazing about visitor experience um, was, um, as Paul mentioned in his actually, um, was about the Disney Making Magic uh, book, which is absolutely fantastic. Heartly recommend that. Um, my my favourite book is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which Great of book. course, yes. oh, superb, and has the words "Don't Panic," of course, blazing, which for this year is brilliant. Um, but but in thinking about what I would what I'd go for for this time um, I've gone for something a little bit different so you know we had did talk about how tricky this year has been and, and you talked about mental health and and I, I myself have found periods of this year incredibly difficult you know um, very 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 tough and I have had to really slow down and think about how might you know I've, you, you put so much effort into uh, being the superhero and trying to do the best you can in whatever you know you throw your energy into something but you don't have that ability to recharge your batteries in the same way you know pandemic's taken away so much everything that makes us human you, you're scared to go near people in the street how awful is that you know so thinking about other ways you can try and recharge those batteries so for me I you know I've been reading, I've been walking the dog, I've been drinking too much beer, I've been running, I've been um, you know, learning to play guitar, I've been doing all sorts. And some of that is around mindfulness and meditation um, and thinking about the things that I'm grateful for and the things that do make me happy. So long answer. I told you I can't give a short answer. Can <laughs> I love this though. You make you. a great guess. <laughs> I told you. So I'm going for um, Bill Bailey's Remarkable Guide to Happiness is my oh, book, which has been fabulous. an amazing read. So he wrote it in the early part of the pandemic actually when he was at home locked in and it was he was kind of recounting stories um in his amazing way that he tells stories about times and places and things that he you know reflecting on happiness what makes him happy a lot of it is actually amazing stuff that we should be thinking about in terms of our attractions as we uh, reopen and run our attractions what people love nature art laughing a sense of belonging you know the unexpected and surprises these lovely things that should be part of our uh, part of our attractions because they are places that are meant to make people happy you know all of our places um so yeah bill bailey's remarkable guide to happiness is my is my pick oh that is such a perfect book and that i, I haven't read this book but it sounds like one for me so as ever if you'd like to win a copy of this book if you head over to our twitter account skip the queue and if you retweet this episode announcement with the words i want james's book Uh, then you will be in with a chance of winning your own copy of it. James, it's been such a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. I'm off for a pasty. I'll uh, (laughs) see you again. Enjoy. (laughs) Take care. (laughs) Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.